Words at War. The National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with the Council on Books in Wartime, presents another in this significant program series, Words at War, dramatizations of the most representative books to come out of this great world conflict. Tonight, it's The Guys on the Ground by Captain Alfred Friendly. This is a tremendously heartening book, a grand tribute to the men of the Air Force who rarely, if ever, leave terra firma, whose job in a word is to furnish and fix. Sounds rather humdrum, doesn't it? But wait. The story begins in one of our larger cities. The time is not so long ago. Three young fighter pilots are back on leave after long periods of combat duty, and they've been attending a war bond rally. But now as they return to their hotel suite, they've but one thought in mind. They want to relax. Oh, home sweet home. Oh, oh this couch feels right. I'm pooped. Me for a shower. Will somebody get room service? Because I'm thirsty. Uh, put down that phone book, Collins, and call room service. Oh, yeah, Call the cutie later. Get room service, will you? Wow, mental telepathy, room service. Come in. May I come in? <whistles> Why, uh, sure. Come right in, Hetty. Susie. Ah, uh, that's Captain Pennypacker, Susie. Ignore him. May I introduce myself? I'm, um... Major Richard Collins? Well, that's right, but how do you... Hey, you guys, where's that room... Uh... Oh... Oh. And you're Major Russell, aren't you? She knows our name, Susie does. Anybody here expecting summons or something? <laughs> I'm no legal beagle, just a newspaper reporter. Oh, I see. Is I, that so? I uh, covered the bond rally, and, well, I thought I'd come up here and sort of get an exclusive story. You mean about all the thrilling battles we were in, huh? And uh, how it feels to shoot down an enemy plane. Like, kind of, this is the stuff of which American heroes are made and so forth? Mm, something to clip out and send to the folks back home. What do you say? What do you say, boys? What do you say? Uh, sit down, Susie. Thank you. Well, here I am. Pencil, notebook. Shoot. Uh, you want a good story? I mean a good story. Sure. Dick, tell her about the coffin coffin. You mean the plane down at the Bond Rally? That's right. That's her name, the coffin coffin. You know, like Winnie Cough. She flew 50 missions before being sent on this Bond tour routine. Go on, Dick. Sounds all right. Well, uh, I flew her over... 20 missions myself before I was transferred. And after that, she went on to 50 missions. But before that... Martin, B-26, 117858. Well, what's wrong with her, Collins? I can't say, sir. Then why do you want another ship? Well, all I know is she doesn't handle right. The, the engines don't function properly and the controls are awkward. Nothing you can put your finger on, sir, but she's been that way ever since I got her a week ago. I understand a number of crews have had the same experience with her and have managed to, well, to get rid of her. Uh, I mean, transferred, sir. Ah, funny business. The mechanics can't find a thing wrong with her. Where is she now? Outside on the airstrip, sir. I think I'll try her myself just to see... Oh, I, I wouldn't do that. Not if I were the CO, sir. So you think she's jinxed, huh, Carl? I certainly do, sir. <laughs> then she can be de-jinxed. Let's go. Oh, but, sir, I... I said come along, Major. Yes, sir. This particular ship has still to fly her first mission, I understand. She's due to fly it today. Under your command, huh? I sincerely hope not, sir. I'd prefer some other ship, any other ship. But if the mechanics can't find anything wrong with her, the trouble must be imaginary, which I propose to prove this morning. Yes, sir. There she is. Looks like any other B-26 to me. What's wrong, Major? I believe you're actually pale. Why, I know you'll, you'll think I'm foolish or something, but... I'd appreciate it more than you'll realize if you'd reconsider your intention of flying that ship. Let me remind you, Major, that superstition cannot be given the status of a legitimate factor in warfare. It isn't superstition, sir. It's... It's, it's... just a jinx, eh? <laughs> Come on. Here we are. Let's climb in. Well, I'll be... Hey, look at her nose. Look huh? at her nose, sir. Her nose? Well, what about... Well, <laughs> seems as though 117858's got herself a name. The Coffin... Coffin. The coffin coffin. Under a death's head. An artistic little job. That does it. Does what, Major? That does it. Yes, sir, the coffin coffin. Well, I'll, I'll fly her now, sir. Why? Well, you see, uh, having a name like that, well, 
It de-jinxes her. I say, uh, do I? <laughs> you mean that when a ship acquires a name that's funny in a gruesome sort of way, she changes from a jinxed ship into a lucky one? Yes, sir, something like that. Well, then all's well, and I can go back to my work, Major? Yes, sir. Thank you. I'll go now. Oh, uh, sir. Uh... Oh, Major. Now, what are you? Uh, I'm in charge of servicing this ship, sir. Can I do anything for you, sir? Now, wait a minute. You were listening into my conversation with the CEO. Me? Oh, no, sir. Say, how long have you been in charge of this, um, of the coffin coffin? Well, since the first day we got her, sir. Major, there ain't a thing wrong with her. I, I know she's been getting a brush off from all you combat guys, but I've been over her a hundred times, and she's a sweetheart. You think she's okay, then, huh? You bet, sir. Oh, by the way, um... When I brought her down last night on our instrument test, she didn't have a name. Now, uh, you wouldn't uh, happen to know who gave her that name, would you? And uh, who might have painted it on her nose last night? Oh, no, sir. No? Couldn't say. Uh, but if you ask me, it ain't a bad name at all. Uh, speaking plain out, sir. Don't, don't you think it's uh, pretty good? I think it's terrific. Yeah, ain't it? What's your name? Joe. Uh, I mean, uh... Okay, Joe. Okay? Then what? Well, after I got switched to another theater, Joe and I kept in touch. She kept flying all those missions, and Joe and his crew put more hunks of aluminum into her shot-up hide than they could count. They changed her engines and fittings so often that all was left of the original coffin was her name. But, and here's the payoff, not one man in any of her various crews was even slightly wounded. Well, on her 50th and final mission. Hey, Joe, listen. Somebody's coming in. I'm trying to, you mean. Better get the crash truck and the meat wagon, too. Hello. Crash landing coming up. Check the crash truck and meat wagon. Right. Hey, look! It's the coffin! Yeah. One motor's out. Look at that belly full of flat. It's all torn off. The wings all chewed up, too. Look at that right landing wheel. Son of a gun. The strut shot off. Oh, why didn't they bail out? Here she comes. I don't want to see it. Open your eyes, Joe. They made it. They made it? Yeah. Come on, let's go. Hey, you guys in there. Okay, Joe. Not a scratch on anybody. Uh, everybody alive but the coffin. Yeah. The coffin's ready for the scrap heap this time. Fifty missions. Count them. No, sir, they ain't burying the coffin, nobody. We'll put it together again. She's got more lives than a barrel of pussycat. We'll put it together again, and she'll fly. And that's just what happened, Susie. Joe and his guys put her together again, and that's why she's making this bond tour we're on. Yeah, the coffin's still enjoying the best of health. That's a good story, but... Well, but what? Well, how about something that's got more bang-bang to it? You mean shooting down enemy planes and all that? Sure, that's the stuff. Oh, come on, boys, don't be modest. After all, you're heroes. Have a smoke? Thanks. Well, uh, I'll tell you one. Tell her about the odds and ends. She was a two-in-one. A ship that was made out of the front end of a smash bomber and the back end of another one. The guys on the ground took those two parts and put them together like a surgeon would put a hand on a wrist with all the nerves and muscles and blood vessels hooked up perfectly. Yeah, I heard about that, but uh, I saw this one. Lots of action, eh? You said it. Go ahead. I'm taking it all down. Uh, this was when I was in India. I was in temporary charge of the squadron, ten liberators. Uh, one day I had to send for them into the service center. 
They were in bad trouble. What's the dope on those four liberators, Sergeant? It's the generator cannon plugs busted, cracked wide open, no can fix. How, how long will it take to install new ones? There ain't any in stock. But we can't keep four bombers out of action until we get some from the States. Our force is small enough as it is. This is serious. Can't you put them together again somehow? With what? The only stuff that's any good for generator plugs is something that can be machined, that won't break or crack, that can stand terrific heat, and that won't conduct electricity. Wonderful. We can't get along with four bombers less. Fine time for me to be put in charge of this outfit. Think of something, will you, Joe? Oh, sure, sure. Okay. I'll be back. Uh, oh, murder. Hey, Joe, come on over here, will you? Yeah? we got to invent something. Again? Cannon plugs. Uh-oh. Four ships out of ten grounded indefinitely on account of some lousy plugs we ain't got. Dust off your brains, kid. we got to think of something. That's no good. Good. Anybody knows you can't graft rubber onto composition stuff. I know it's up. I what... hate to get tough about this, Joe, but unless we get those four bombers back in the air, we're going to lose most of the other six. The odds are big enough the way we've been working with ten. Uh, yes, sir. We looked everywhere, but there ain't a thing around that's right for generator plugs. But I can't send bombers into action unable to fire their guns, can I? You're asking me to work a miracle, Captain, and I don't know how. Well... We'll keep at it. Okay. I'll be back. Come on, Joe. What? You forgot to eat dinner. Oh, nuts. No eat, no can work now. Come on. Oh, what a war. Generator plugs. What do they think I am, anyway? Expect me to pull miracles. Look at that road. I think by this time they'd get horses to pull their go-karts instead of them clumsy buffaloes. <laughs> Look at them clod-hopping animals. Such intelligent faces. Their horns look plenty sharp, don't they? Uh, horns. I wonder. Horns. I got it. Huh? Come on, Joe. We're buying buffalo horns. <laughs> Can't break them. What's next? Oh, we'll throw them in the furnace and see what happens. Here. Okay. In the furnace. And now what? Well, next thing, sir, we check this other pair for electrical conductivity like this. Uh, now I give them the juice. Go on. 2,200 volts. Look at that meter, sir. <laughs> Register zero. Good. Uh, now if they'll only stand the heat. Look at them in there. Red hot already. Uh, lift them out with the pinches and drop them in the dirt. Right. Oh, hand me the sledge, sir. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, stand back. Look. Yeah. <laughs> Not even a splinter. You did it, guys. Yeah. Slap them on the lathe, size them and shape them, drill holes in them for the points, and buffalo horns get the big cannon plug. You did it. Yeah. Hey, Buffalo's wonderful. This is Words at War, presenting tonight a graphic answer to those people who say that we Americans have lost our old pioneer skills. The three generations of the machine have weaned us from our handicraft ability. This dramatization of the guys on the ground by Captain Alfred Friendly proves beyond doubt that to the old frontierman's cunning, modern Americans have added the skill to work on their problems with machines, that by using machines, we creatively have become the conquerors of raw nature. Now back to Major Russell, Captain Pennypacker, and Major Collins. How about a drink? 
certainly is a swell angle. I mean, the ground crews. Yeah, you don't hear much about them, but... Uh... But they don't make good copy. I mean, the way you fellas do. The fighter pilots have captured the imagination of the people. Oh, no, wait a minute. Don't get the idea the service command stays on the ground all the time. Hey, Russell, what about the one you were in with that, uh, that kid? What's his name? Coldwater. Joe Coldwater. He was killed by a bomb about a month ago. But he and I did a little job together. Something extra special. Would you mind? It was to fly a plane out of a spot where it was repaired following a crash in England. The idea is to save valuable time getting it back to action. I remember that jeep and that... You boys, Russell and Coldwater? Yes, sir. I'm mighty glad to see you. Too glad if you ask me. Shut up. I'm Captain Squires. You had your lunch? Yes, sir, but we darn near lost it in the jeep. Oh, don't worry about the field. The engineers are laying out a runway for you. Well, let's take a look. Well, now, uh, you, you say you're sure you've had your lunch? Yeah, Stu. Now, about that runway. How about some cold beer? No, we don't want it. Did you say cold beer? Where? Just around this little bend. Come on. You know, to be perfectly honest about it, we're not too enthusiastic about that runway. The footing's very soft, and we've had to chop through a hill. Well, what the heck, if we have to haul her away by tractor, we will. You guys are supposed to be good at these trick takeoffs, but... I don't want you to be too good. Yeah, that's what my girl told me. Um, in here. They got an ice box. Oh, the civilians here are wonderful. We get two cases a day from the village pub. Goodwill gesture. Been here long? About uh, twenty-two cases. <laughs> oh, I see. <laughs> here you are. Mm-hmm. And he's looking at you. Luck. Oh, that was all right. Yeah. Nice and cold. Now, here's the layout. The engineers have just about cleared 3,100 feet. Not too good, but not so bad either. Depending on the ground. We've been pounding it, trying to harden it up. Halfway down the runway, we made a cut in the hill to keep the path level. But, did you say path? That's right. Got any idea of the wing clearance? About six feet on either side. Oh, that's ducky. Of course, we could go to work and slap down some more of that hill. No, that wouldn't help much, I'm afraid. Doing it without a steam shovel would take too much time. Anyway, the wing clearance doesn't bother me too much. It don't? I'm thinking about the ground. Feels like second cousin to a swamp in spots. 3,100 feet is okay if she'll keep from sinking into the mush. It's a case of threading a needle at 80 miles an hour any way you look at it. Yeah, with a needle propelled by 4,800 horsepower. Hmm. Well, let's take a look anyway. Well, Joe, what do you say? You want to try it? Why ask me? You're the guy at the controls. I only sit with you. I depend on you. You're the only guy that knows this ship. You want to look that strip over again? Ah, uh, what for? Okay, I'll send for the tractor. We'll haul her to town, put her on a flat car, and call it the best we could do. Personally, I don't blame you one bit. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Joe, she's stripped of all unnecessary weight, and, uh... You're, you're going to do it? Not on my own, Joe. I need you. Oh. oh, I see what you mean. Well, uh, uh, say, Captain Squires. Yes? How about us borrowing a couple of bottles of beer? We're going to be awful thirsty up there. Sure thing. Okay, Joe. <laughs> so long. Good luck. Good luck. Now we're moving. Easy, baby. What's her name again? Stella. Come on, Stella, give. Here we come to that big bad hill. Show it your skirts, baby. Had a girl? Yeah. We're in the clear. Thank you, Stella. I say goodbye to everybody. Come on now. Come on. She's sinking in. Give her the gun. Come on, like a sweetheart. Upset Daisy. Easy now, easy nothing. She made it. We're in the air. Stella, honey, I love you. Honest. I, uh... 
I think I'm beginning to get the point. I'm up here on a story about fighter pilots. What I'm getting from you fellas is the story behind you. The story below us, you mean? Yeah, the kids doing all that dirty and tedious work that keeps us in the air. They're the same kids who used to keep their flivvers in one piece with haywire, chewing gum, and rubber bands. Say, that's a swell angle. Uh, how much of all this we've been telling you are they going to put in the paper? Well, that depends. Well, Collins, hmm? remember that one down in India that you were telling us about, you and that liberator? Yeah, that's right. Listen to this one, Susie, if you're looking for something sensational. Go on, Dick. Well, it's not about me. I, I just happen to be the pilot. I flew a B-24 uh, supporting the British campaign in Burma. Well, coming back to the British fighter aerodrome, we caught help from the Japs. We came back through the clouds with one engine out. And breaking through the overcast, we found ourselves over a Jap airfield. Well, they opened up with everything they had. They'd caught us for fair. We stumbled on a few miles and landed on the British field. It was too close to the front lines for any big ship to stay, and we, we couldn't move without extensive repairs, so we put in a call for assistance. It flowed back to a China-Burma-India command center in Bengal province. Technical Sergeant Duke reporting, sir. Oh, yes. Uh, one of our B-24s is shot down near a Jap airfield over at Akyab. We want that plane. Yes, sir. It's a rush job under combat conditions. Yes, sir. Take five mechanics, a replacement engine, and the necessary tools and load them into a transport. When can you take off, Rakyab? We'll be in the air in less than two hours. And thank you, sir. How's it coming on the fuselage, O2? Uh, Two-thirds of our lines and cables are out. Take another five hours at least. It'll take that long to put our wings together. You can use some more light. Move over another searchlight here, will you, somebody? Yeah. So I can see what I'm doing. And the Japs, too. We gotta be out of here by dawn. Us, the ship, everything. Before the Japs get a chance to look over the easy pickings. Hey. What's that? It's a Jap plane. Hey, cover, everybody! <laughs> Knew it. Is that you, Duke? Uh, oh, Major Collins. Looks like we slid into the same base. Uh, no good for baseball, but perfect out here. They want that liberator. So do we. Sounds like he's going back to get more bombs. Yeah, and more playmates. Maybe they'll wait until dawn for a pot shot. Uh, they're wasting their time. Okay, you guys. Back to the plane and speed it up, will you? Hey, uh, they got Marlene Dietrich over at the base this afternoon. We don't want to miss her. It was an enormous job. Five men out there in the night doing a job that under normal conditions would take at least a week. And they had only a few hours to dawn. The Japs came over time and again at least three more times. Well, the guys would scramble for cover until the Japs went away, and what got them sore wasn't the bombs as much as the wasted time. Duke had them hopped up about Marlene Dietrich. The crew worked to a point of, well, I guess you'd call it physical collapse. Come on with that engine, will you, O'Toole? We ain't got all day. Think of Dietrich, O'Toole. Luscious, gorgeous. Ah, uh, I should kill myself just to see her. What'd she ever do for me? Funny guy, ain't you? Yeah. My girl says I'm full of jokes. You know what? What? Give me that other wrench. Yeah. When she says I'm full of jokes, I never know, does she mean it? Or is she kidding? What's your opinion, Sarge? I mean, from the heart. Ah, uh, go on back to work. What for? Because if you don't, we'll all get our pants knocked off. <laughs> <laughs> What's so funny? <laughs> O'Toole! No, sir, you don't have to use that tone of voice to me because O'Toole is not cracking under the strain. O'Toole is finished with the motor. So tell the Major can tune her up now. That a boy. Major! Hey, Major! And so 
Just as there was the faintest streak of gray in the black skies, I took over the controls of the ship barely 48 hours after she'd limped in, practically wrecked. Yeah, thanks to six guys who worked straight through without a let-up. The ship had a new engine, airworthy wings, and foolproof controls. A new lease on her fighting line. Yeah, she sounded like the swingiest jazz band in the world. Duke came over to say goodbye. Good luck, Major. Thanks. I'll never forget you guys. Major, an enemy plane coming down to get you. Take off! Take off! I gave her all she could take and got off the spot after I'd gone about 200 yards. The Jap's bomb hit the exact spot where my ship had been a moment before. But Duke's guys had the satisfaction of seeing British fighters knock down two of the raiders from their slit trenches. Hey, Duke. What? You were kidding about Dietrich being over to the base today, weren't you? Yeah. It was just a gag. Yeah. That's what I like about this war. It's full of jokes. On the Japs. Well, can I get you something, Susie? Please. Thanks. Well, did you get that one all down on paper? I want to thank you boys for a marvelous story. It's, well, it's really a new slant. The guys on the ground. All they get is the jobs, no medals, no ribbons, no publicity. Yeah. And when they read about this hero and that hero and all the planes he shot down, they darn well know that the ground guys made all those victories possible. I've got the story. And thanks a million. Now all I need is a lead. You know, first sentence. Got any ideas? Um, how about this? Quote. If a motto ever truly belonged to any group of men, this one belongs to the guys on the ground. The difficult, we do immediately. The impossible takes a bit longer. Unquote. Tonight on Words at War, we've brought you Guys on the Ground by Captain Alfred Friendly. The radio dramatization was by Peter Martin. The cast included Frank Lovejoy, Lawson Zerby, James Monks, Bill Quinn, Larry Haynes, Louis Van Ruten, Martha Falconer, Michael Fitzmorris, and Owen Jordan. The music was arranged and played by William Meter, and the production was under the direction of Herbert Rice. <laughs> Next week, Words at War will present the radio dramatization of You, Your Children by Marie Serkin. This series of programs is brought to you in cooperation with the Council on Books and Wartime by the National Broadcasting Company and the independent radio stations associated with the NBC network.